Ethan Ray Hill. Hi. Well, good morning. I wasn't watching the time. I forgot we're doing this stuff live, so you got to chop chop. My wife is in the back there socializing, so it ain't just the preacher who talks too much, okay? Hey, we're glad that you're here today. If you're visiting with us, my name is Steve. This is my wife, Michelle. We're glad that you're with us today. I'm getting my sermon in order while I'm talking to you here, and I had a bulletin. Matt, this is why you should have done <laughs> Hey, there's a lot of stuff going on. There's prayer cards here. If you would like to uh, submit a prayer request, you can fill that out. We will put that on our prayer list here. You notice our prayer list is a little bit smaller. We try to keep names on there uh, for three to four weeks. If we don't hear any updates from anyone after that, sometimes people put them on there. We never know what's going on. We'll, we'll remove that name. Don't be offended if we take your name off. Just tell us, hey, there's still, there's still something going on. We'll put it back on. But it just kind of helps us to know um, if uh, things are getting better in someone's situation or not. So be aware of that. <clears throat> In your bulletin, I want to encourage you to take time to read your bulletin. I know that many times you don't. I understand that because you'll be like, I didn't know that was going on. And we say it was in the bulletin. You'll be like, oh, I forgot to get a bulletin. So please pick up your bulletin. Sarah takes a lot of time to make sure this information is correct and uh, puts energy and effort into that. And if you want to know what's going on, it's the primary best way we have to let you know what's happening. So you've got the trap shoot going on. Devos and Donuts is kicking back again this week. I know uh, school is going to be coming in soon. There's the, uh, the extravaganza, pool extravaganza for the children's stuff. Life groups, I want to remind you about life groups. You have an orange card in there. If you want to be involved in a life group or if you want to lead a life group, you're interested in doing a new life group, fill out this card, place it in the, in the offering trays here or at the Welcome Center there. Uh, we need to get this information back. We plan on putting out uh, some printed information on August 21st. 
So that's not that very uh, that far away because the launch, I know the uh, high school is launching a little bit earlier than us, but the Wednesday nights, uh, children's stuff's going to be kicking back off on September uh, 7th. That's that first Wednesday of September. We'll be doing some uh, new adult uh, stuff. I'll be teaching a new Bible study class. There'll be other things going on. So if you're interested in that, please get this to us so we can make sure that your small group um, if you, especially if you plan on leading one, if you want to lead one, we need to get that information back. And if you want to be involved in one, we're going to get that printed stuff to you so that as the church grows, uh, the larger, uh, and that sort of thing, we need to be growing smaller and interconnecting with one another, just doing life together. So please, please be, uh, aware of that. Dinner theater is coming up. <clears throat> oh yes. Before we get to dinner theater, I want to talk about church in the park on September 11th. We're going to have church in the park. Uh, if you come here, you got to preach, okay, because there won't be anybody here. But if you go to the park, I know the preacher out there, he's pretty good. I like him. So go to the church in the park. <laughs> Don't listen to the heckler in the crowd, all right? I can't even hear what he's saying to me. But um, church in the park, we're going to be uh, having worship out there. We're going to have a cookout out there and just kind of have a good time. Lincoln Trail. So there's information <clears throat> about that. So um if, if there's someone that you know that comes on Sunday and you don't see them here today, take time to remind them so they don't show up on the 11th and go, where did everyone go? And we'll tell them, it was the rapture. You didn't make it. You know, so uh, <laughs> we should put a sign on the church and say, we got raptured. You didn't. Sorry, but we won't do that. <laughs> That's bad, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> I think it's funny preaching comedy. But anyway. Hey, uh, just let them know, Church in the Park, September 11th. Okay, Dinner Theater, you see a table out there, it's coming up. You might want to know, what is Dinner Theater all about? Uh, I'm going to have Michelle take over and tell you about Dinner Theater and how you can get involved and what its uh, purpose is. Hey guys, first of all, I just want to say I'm glad to be back. I was gone for two weeks traveling and it's super great to be back. If anybody follows me on Facebook, you see me talk about some anxiety that I've dealt with uh, as we have been... Uh, back ministering and I didn't feel any of that this morning I just felt excited to be back in the house of the Lord with you guys so I just want to share that with you um, so that you know that uh, that this feels like a, a good and safe place and it felt good to be back here today um, so dinner theater you may be asking yourself what is dinner theater I'm starting to see signups and signs and fill in so dinner theater is just what it says it is it is uh, an evening that we are going to offer to our community actually two evenings that we're going to offer to our community that is a full dinner and a full play um, and that we're just going to invite people to. It's going to be a free community event. Hopefully we'll probably serve about 200 uh, people an evening, maybe a little more, maybe a little less. So we'll just see what happens. But um, And so we're super, super excited. And so you might want to know why. Why are we doing dinner theater? Um, so easily uh, dinner theater is kind of serves two purposes. The first purpose is that for several weeks now, Steve's been talking about just one. Uh, his sermon series is different today, but he's been talking about just one. Hopefully you guys have been thinking about those just ones in your life that you need to reach out to, that you need to love on, that you need to invite to church. And dinner theater is an opportunity, creates an opportunity to invite people to church without inviting them to church. Um, it's an evening that you can invite them. Hey, come out. We have this free evening of dinner and a show, and we're just going to have a lot of fun. The play is funny. It is not heavy. It is not. It's just a great way to kick off the season. And um, so that's the first thing it does is it just creates opportunity for you to invite friends and neighbors who don't know Jesus. We are we're excited. We know there will be other people from the community that's going to come that already has a church home, and we're going to celebrate the season with them as well. But we really want this to be about inviting people um, who need the opportunity to meet Jesus and we're gonna we're just providing a way to do that so um, so be praying about that that one person or those few people that you need to invite um, that you hope can see the hands and feet of Jesus so that's the purpose once Pur second purpose is for us as a church body we have uh, first service and second service and I know sometimes there are people I know as I'm talking to people and learning people they don't know people from the other service um, this is a great way for our whole entire church body to come together and work together, have fun together, laugh together, um, all those things that it's going to create. And so I just encourage you, sign up. 
If you have questions, come see me. We need people to act, first of all. So I've started seeing some names on the acting list. I'm so excited. Um, we always have women who are more willing than men. We need men, too. So if uh, I know several of you are characters. I've met you, seen you, talked to you. Um, so even if you've never acted on stage, I am certain that you can act because uh, you act up every day. So, uh, so sign up. Um, we have a couple of kid roles, like for boys, they could probably be girl roles too, so uh, just keep that in mind if you have children. Um, and so, but not only that, if you're not an upfront person, which I get, um, I was never an upfront person. You can ask Steve many moons ago when we first did dinner theater at a church we were attending. Uh, Steve said, hey, you've been doing dinner theater, so you're going to talk the whole night of dinner theater. You're emceeing the night. I said, absolutely not. And I threw up before I got up. I could not hold a microphone in my hand. I actually had to wear a headset because I shook too much. And I had note cards that I had to read from. Um, as you can see, that's not the case now. So uh, God grows us um, in areas. And so some of the other areas that we have are background areas. We need people who can who are willing to be servers, who are willing to serve food the night of dinner theater. We need people who are greeters, who are willing to greet. We need people who will do coat check. That's a whole new thing that we've got to figure out because in Florida, you don't worry about coats in December, sorry. Um, so we will need people to do childcare the night of just for our workers' kids. We don't provide childcare for the community, but we will for any, anybody who maybe has kids that will be working that night. Um, people to do parking, people to do food, people to do tech, people to do set building, people to, to um, be stagehands, like everybody uh, has a place to be involved. So literally we're a church of 200, we will probably need about 100 people to really make this a success. And even if you are like, I don't know what to sign up for, show up, because we just want people to see the love of Jesus through us. We want to be able to mingle and talk and share. Um, one of the things that we hope to create here that you guys already are so good at. We were just talking this morning in Sunday school about what a loving um, church this is, uh, just d loving each other and caring for each other. And we want our community to just see uh, that, you know, and, and we want to provide opportunity. So sign up, come see me if you have questions. Sign up to act, men out there. I know women, there are still women roles out there too. So um, come be a part of this. I think it's going to be a really great thing. I'm going to ask us to stand. I'll have an opening prayer, and we'll begin with our worship time. Father God, it's been so good to be here today at this first hour. What a great uh, time together, and this hour that you have before us laid out. As we gather together in song, Father, and around your table, may Jesus be lifted high. May you uh, just in, uh, empower us, Father, with the Holy Spirit, just to live out every day to the fullest for the glory of God. In his name we pray. Amen. Good morning, church. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. I hope you brought some joy with you this morning, but if not, we pray that you would just come in, bring those struggles, and lay them at the Lord's feet. And just take on the joy of those around you as we worship together.
Today uh, is my wife's birthday. Yeah. I haven't, I haven't killed her yet. I don't. But I know that because yesterday our oldest daughter, Katie, came to visit, and when we were eating lunch, announced she wanted to buy lunch for her mother's birthday. That pronouncement came as somewhat of a surprise to me. And after some quick mental gymnastics, I realized that she was correct. I then compounded the situation as we discussed the matter by being off one year on her age in the wrong direction. <laughs> but at least I got Sally's name right, so I guess I don't have anything to do with it. <laughs> Later, I had a chance to reflect on forgetting and remembering. 
Many of us have been through trying times. It may be conflict with family and friends or problems at work, financial difficulties. We may face significant life-changing events, end of a marriage or relationship, loss of job and income, our own health issues, or perhaps even worse, the health issues of family members and their passing and leaving us behind. These are all very difficult times and frequently they lead to questioning. Why did this happen? Where was God? Why didn't he do something? And sometimes I hear from people, God forgot about me. Why did he forget me? Don't I matter? I do not know why people go through these very, very difficult times. I cannot explain it. But I do know that God loves you very much, and he does not forget you. Scripture tells us that he knew you before you were born, that he knows you so well that he numbers the hairs on your head, that he loves you so much he sent his only son to die for you personally. In the book of Isaiah and Psalms, similar thoughts of being forgotten or forsaken are expressed. And in Isaiah 49, 15, God answers, Can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she has born? Though she may forget, I will not forget you. The last thing Jesus said on earth, as recorded in the book of Matthew, is surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. He is not with us only in the good times or the easy times. He is with us always, which includes the difficult, heart-wrenching, dark times. I don't know what you're facing or will face in the future, but God will not forget you. He loves you too much. But there is something God does forget, and this is good news for all of us. That is our sins and our transgressions. In Hebrews 8.12, the writer quotes the book of Jeremiah and writes, For I will forgive their wickedness, And I will remember their sins no more. Later in Hebrews chapter 10, starting in verse 12, he writes, But when this priest, being Jesus Christ, had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. Since that time he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool, because by one sacrifice he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. The Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. First he says, This is the covenant I will make with them. After that time, says the Lord, I'll put my laws in their hearts, and I will write them on their minds. And then he adds, Their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. Not only will God forgive our sins, but he will totally erase and forget them. He's not keeping a list to see if you repeat the same one over and over or if you pile up too many of them, there's some consequence. When we come and repent from what we've done and ask for forgiveness, he forgives. And the sin is, in God's mind, as if it never happened. And this is all due, as the writer in Hebrews says, due to the one-time sacrifice of Christ Jesus his death and his ultimate victory through his resurrection, which we remember and we celebrate now. I hope and pray you all have had a good week this past week and a better one coming week, in this coming week. But remember, in all you do and face that God loves you and will never leave or forget or forsake you. And when we, as unperfect people, commit our sins and transgressions, 
If we repent and ask for forgiveness, he will forget those ever occurred. And I don't know if there's some here that don't know Christ. Some who feel their sins and their life is so unworthy they can't possibly become one of God's children. I know that for many of us, including myself, we came as adults with a long list of baggage and problems. Unworthiness, and God loved us and brought us into that. If you're in that position... I just encourage you to make today the day of your new life. Come, ask for forgiveness and repentance. Make Christ your Lord and Savior. Let's pray. Father, we come now to our time of communion. A time when we can sit and reflect back on the day of our new life. Now through your Holy Spirit and the intervention of saints, you came and taught each one of us in different circumstances, in different places, about the God who loves us and the Savior who died for us and rose again from the dead. We thank you for that. We ask for forgiveness for the times we've fallen short in this past week. We ask that you help us do better in the coming week. We know that uh, we are only human, that it's our path to try and become more like you step by step and day by day and we ask your assistance in that but we ask especially that you help us to teach others that the people we come in contact with will see you through us that lives will be transformed that in the future people will be able to look back and be thankful that we cross their path because they came to know you in part because of our efforts. Help us, Lord, to keep our eyes on you in all we do. We love you so much, and we are so, so thankful. And it's in Jesus' name we pray.
Well, how's everyone doing today? Good? If you're glad to be in the house of the Lord, say amen. amen. All right. Just want to make sure you're glad to be here. I'm glad to be here. If you have your Bible, I hope you do. I'd like you to open up to the book of Luke, the gospel of Luke in the seventh chapter. That's where our text is going to be coming from. The main portion of our text will be coming from today. We are going to begin a new series over the next uh, six, seven, eight weeks or so called a Q&A with Jesus, and we're going to be looking at questions that people ask Jesus. I know there's several very difficult questions that were asked of Jesus. Should we pay taxes? Is it right to be divorced? How many times do I need to forgive my neighbor? There's some tough things that Jesus asked, and we're going to deal with those issues. I won't deal with all of those questions in this series, but I will come back and address some of them in a separate uh, series. So I don't want you to think like, oh, we shine away from tough, tough, tough topics. One thing you'll find out about me is I don't do that. So we will, adri- we will address some of those things, but uh, in, a, in a different setting there. But what I want to do today is just kind of open in with what I think is the first thing we need to, de- to deal with, and that is just talking about the person of Jesus. I know I got a little wound up in the first, <laughs> first service. It actually ran long. We didn't even do the last songs. I'm like, I'm just going to pray and go because I could hear you out there let us in kind of thing there, and I knew if I didn't let the song team at least warm up one song, I would uh, <laughs> be in trouble, so you guys got one song, I'm, that's about all you got, okay, I'm sorry. <clears throat> Michelle and I have been pretty transitory for the last year or so in our lives. <clears throat> Two years ago or so, we married off our daughter, they uh, just celebrated their second anniversary at the beginning of August, and that was great, and our son, at that time, was 20 hours away from us in college in Missouri. We were empty nesters and ready to leave, and just life changes, so we sold our house in Florida. We uprooted from our lives there of the last 15 years, and we stepped out into an unknown future. We talked about just RVing for a year to figure out where we were going to go, so we bought what I thought would be large enough of a camper, and I'm starting to find out it's feeling a little small. You know what I'm saying? I hit my head on a door, and that caused some non-Jesus words to come out I'll just be honest with you and then five minutes later Michelle hit her head on the door and she said Steve we got to get out of this camper I said I I understand sweetie I understand we're working on that so God's blessing us and that's coming along we started to travel though and um, we were thinking that I was going to work at a campground in North Carolina we wanted to see the fall leaves and everything, so I took this uh, job over the phone, talked to him, I'm going to do maintenance at this historical spring place, fixing on cabins and stuff like that. Two days before I'm ready to go to the job, I get a call from Missouri that says, we happen to have your resume from an earlier job that got filled, and we'd like to know if you'd like to come out and work in this maintenance department, and some stuff happened with our son, breaking his arm and different things, and so I felt like God was leading us out there, so we decide we're going to go to Joplin, Missouri, on our drive out of Florida. And then we said, well, let's go vacation a little. We, we haven't gotten away, so we drove up to New York, went to Niagara Falls for a week, and had to come down and fix some stuff in the camper and whatnot. We made our way over to our new job at Ozark Christian College. We bought a house there and started making plans, started fixing it. And I started to think that God might be calling us back into the preaching ministry, which was very unusual because when I left Florida I said I would never do this again 20 years had been enough I'd been in the meat grinder long enough and I just the the hurt and pain we'd left from some of those ministries I just said I wouldn't do it again but now being there I just felt like God was maybe speaking to us again within a few days of pursuing that God nudge in my life I was told basically that I had lied on my resume for the college and I was fired that was the first time anything like that had happened to me in my life our house repairs were not complete. We had fold-up furniture in the, in the house. We, were, we, we didn't even have a working kitchen. The cabinets were all apart. And I thought, we're going to have months to fix this. And now I had, you know, no job. And just, we got to sell this house. First time we ever bought a house debt-free in our life. We were in it for three months and had to get rid of it. You know what I'm saying? That kind of thing was happening in our lives. After declining to pursue a church offer, to us in Springfield, Missouri, which I felt like maybe we should go to, but after thinking it through, there was just some signs there that made us uncomfortable, and I said, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to pass on this right now. We were contacted by the Marshall Pastor Search Team. 
Just a few months after that, you know, we've relocated here to a new place in the middle of another house remodel, new career getting started, new friendships being formed. With all of that upheaval going on in our lives, Michelle and I began this little thing that just kind of works with us where we'd look at each other and we would say, loves me? Loves you too. I look at her and say, loves me. She always replies back to me, love you. And I always reply back to her, love you too. And then she would do the same thing to me. So I want to let you in on our little love nest fun here, okay? I'm going to say to the whole crowd, love you. See, love you too. It feels good to be told that. And we say this, I mean, multiple times a day. Because it reassured us that in the whirlwind of our life right now, we are loved by each other. And it's been very good for us. When your life hits rock bottom and God seems quiet and distant, you can start to think, did I make a mistake? Did I make a wrong choice somewhere along the way? <clears throat> Should I have chosen a different path to follow or a different profession to pursue? Or even did I marry the wrong person? It's at these times in your life that you need a reassurance that you need to hear, love me, love you too. John the Baptist was a man who found himself in that kind of place a place that he did not see coming. He was struggling to understand God's plan for him and Jesus' impact on his life and the ministry, and he needed reassurance. And so he sent a question to Jesus by way of his uh, disciples, and he said, this was the question, are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? Now that's quite a question for the Son of God, isn't it? He started his ministry, and John, you know, there's the things we look at, that John knew about who Jesus was, and he's asking, are you the one or should we expect someone else? This morning what I want to do is just look closer at this one question that was asked and Jesus' response, because it gave John encouragement in his day, and I would say it's going to give us encouragement in our day today. So can we do that this morning? Say yes. Okay, because that's what we're going to do. All right. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads. We're going to pray to God as we begin. So let's commit this time to the Lord as we pray. Father God, we thank you for this day. I thank you, Father, for laying this message on my heart and having the opportunity to share. Father, I hope that you help me get out of the way so that people just hear the word of God. I thank you, Father, for this loving congregation. I know it's not perfect. There is not a perfect church because any church there is that I'm in, it's not going to be perfect. We are imperfect people. But Father, you died for those who were imperfect. You came for those who were sick, that we might be healed. And in this place, Father, we are being healed and continue to be healed from the sins of this world and the struggles that come our way through the power and blood of Christ. Father, I pray for those today who are just struggling, like John, might be asking that question or... or are you the God that cares and loves me? Because I'm just not sure. And I hope they hear, Father, from your voice and they hear, yes, I love you. Father, we just commit this time and this message to you. May your spirit fill this place, open our hearts and minds to receive. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. There is a, in your bulletin, there's a place where you can write some notes. So we're not going to be projecting a bunch of things and 14 points and that. I just want you to kind of hear the message, and we're going to have one main idea that I think will be very easy for all of us to take home as we leave here today. In Luke chapter 7, verses 16 is where we want to begin. They were filled with awe and praised God. A great prophet has, has appeared among us, they said. God has come to help his people. Now, this is because a miracle has just happened. If you'd read earlier in chapter 7, you'd see a miracle has just happened, the raising of the widow's son at name. This news about Jesus spread throughout Judea and the surrounding country, and John's disciples told him about all these things. Calling two of them, he sent them to the Lord, asked, Are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? And when the men came to Jesus, they said, John the Baptist has sent us to ask you, are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone 
else. It's interesting that Luke, who writes this gospel, who also writes the book of the Acts of the Apostles, that he writes twice this question, are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? Luke wants to make sure that we know what the question is. And here we meet this man, John the Baptist. Now, John is that man that recognized Jesus as the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world, right? You remember, he sees him walking, behold, the Lamb of God takes away the sins of the world. You know, it wasn't that John hadn't known Jesus. Jesus is John's younger cousin by just a few months. I'm sure that they had met one another at some point in their life, going to Jerusalem for the Passover celebrations and all those things. But the Holy Spirit inspires John to see Jesus as the Lamb of God. That one who would take away the sins of the world. He was the one who baptized Jesus. Remember, he came to the River Jordan where John was baptized and Jesus shows up. John says, this is, this is not right. I should not be baptizing you, but rather you should baptize me. And you know that Jesus says, John, to fulfill all righteousness, we need to do this. And so John baptizes Jesus. The Spirit of God descends on Jesus, it says, like a dove resting on him. The voice of God is heard from heaven. This is my son in whom I'm well pleased. It was an amazing moment. John was there, seeing it, hearing it, being a part of that. Now time has passed, and now John is arrested by a man by the name of Herod Antipas, one of the nasty guys of antiquity. Tradition tells us, and Josephus, the historian writer, tells us that he was in prison in the fortress of Machaerus. It's located on the northeast shore of the Dead Sea. So if you can imagine Palestine and you have the Sea of Galilee, the Jordan River, the Dead Sea down here, the northeast corner there, uh, the southeast corner of Perea, northeast corner of the Dead Sea, there was a fortress. We still have the ruins today of this place called Machaerus. That's where we think John was kept. He had been imprisoned there at this time of the writing for about a year. Now, John was that man who was before Herod, Herod several times. He would go before Herod and preach. And he preached bold sermons to him because Herod was in an immoral situation. Herod had actually taken his brother Philip's wife for his own. And John is preaching to him and telling him that this is, a, this is an immoral act. You need to repent of this. God is upset with this here. And though John was intrigued by the preaching, or rather, uh, Herod was intrigued by the preaching of John, he was not transformed by the preaching. He did not change his lifestyle. He did not separate that unholy relationship. While being loved by the people on earth, John's ministry has now taken a turn in a whole different direction. He is imprisoned, and he suffers daily the ramifications of his incarceration. When we imprison people today, we provide for their medical care, and we provide food for them, and they have a cot to sleep on. And I, It's not great. I'm not saying I'd love to be there, but they're not going to starve there or freeze to death. But in John's time, if, if he's going to survive, someone's got to bring him food. Someone's got to bring him clothes when his robes wear out or it's cold bring him a blanket you remember paul asking for that bring the cloaks to timothy when he says come the plight of his followers was growing worse daily and even though john had recognized jesus as the one to come and restore israel the same tyrant is on the throne in galilee and the same emperor is on the throne in Rome, and Rome was still in control. Their hostility towards the, Drew, towards the Jews was still ever-present. John was like most, I think like us, or, or most everyone in their day, that was thinking that when the Messiah would come, he would bring a military or political revolution. And that hadn't happened yet. And in John's mind, he's thinking, when would it happen? And why is there a delay? And then John hears the reports of Jesus' ministry and thinking about his own situation. I mean, isn't that the way of it? Your life is going so bad, you put on some extra pounds and you put on that dress you haven't worn in a long time and it just don't look good. And then you pick up your phone and there's someone that's like Photoshop their thing and they have the most beautiful dress in the world on. They're like, look at my new dress. Or you try to get a date for homecoming dance or whatever and you get rejected and someone goes, oh, Tommy asked me out. I'm so happy. 
I'm going with, you know, the captain of the football team or whatever. Or you lose your job and someone says, this is amazing, I got a raise, 50% raise, it's awesome. Just throwing that out there, guys. I'm just joking. <laughs> you know, when your life hits rock bottom, you pick, up the, you, pick up the, the, you pick up the phone and you see everybody else's highlight reel and it looks like their life is amazing and yours is, is in the dumper. And that's John. John. John's ministry is not gone the way he wants, but he hears Jesus' ministry is going great. And even though John said, he must increase and I must decrease, he knows that intellectually, but emotionally that probably had to be hard at times. I mean, I would struggle at times when different churches I was at, and, and we were struggling with ever. and I'd talk to my friend and go, well, we had a new building program. We built a new gym. We built a new this and new that. And I'm like, what in the world is going on? Don't send me your highlight reels when my life's in the dumper. That's how we were feeling. That's how John was feeling. So John sends his disciples to ask the question, are you the one who was the come or should we expect another? Now commentators have understood this reasoning to kind of fall down into two basic camps. There's several different variations, but it basically comes down to two things. One can understand the question in this, that John is asking the question for the benefit of John's disciples who are seeing John's situation, and maybe they're starting to think like, nah, John, this can't be right. He can't be the Messiah. You know, you're here. Why would, why would God put you here in this dungeon? You know, Herod's not listening to you. This isn't good. And so they think that John's holding firm. He understands Jesus' ministry. He's okay with what's going on, but he wants his disciples to realize this is the plan of God. So go ask this question, and Jesus is going to remind you that this is the way it should be. Well, I guess that's one way to look at it. The other way to look at it is this, that John was asking for his own reassurance. He trusted in the words that he had said, inspired by the Holy Spirit about Jesus. I'm not saying that he did, that he went back on that. But his present situation was causing him some doubts. If the Messiah were here, why was he, John, in prison? Why was he facing such terrible circumstances? Now, because I like to read the Bible with what I call, without what I call, precious moment glasses. You know what precious moments glasses are? You know what precious moments are, right? The little, little figurines are, that are pastel colors and everything. One of my favorite little figurines is where there's the guy and the girl, and the girl is holding the hammer, and she's like, ooh. And the boy, there's a, there's a nail there, and his thumb's like 17 times the size it should be because she smacked his thumb, and he's just looking at her like, now, if my wife smacked my thumb, I wouldn't be looking at her like, I'd be like, girl, man, what's your problem? Wouldn't go good for me that night, I'm just saying. But, you know, but we precious moments things. We take life and, and we, we glamour it all up. I, I tell Michelle, because Michelle, I'm generally, I'm working on this, but I'm generally the glass is half empty kind of person. I tend to see the negative first. Michelle is like the glass is three quarters full. You know what I'm saying? She's like, she's, uh, so we balance each other out in that way. But I used, I used to say to her until she got on, I said, stop looking at the world through rose-colored glasses. Look at it. I live in Realville. Well, one day she got me rose-colored glasses, and she said, you might try these. It would help out. <laughs> I put them on, and it hadn't helped out. I just, eh, it still looks as crappy as it did before. You know, whatever. I don't like to look at the Bible through rose-colored glasses. And so when I look at this, I think that John is struggling to hold to the truth that he knows in his heart because he sees the reality of going around him and it just doesn't make sense. I think it's kind of like Thomas when Thomas says to Jesus, I believe, help my unbelief. Have you ever found yourself there? In a pit? In a dungeon? In a situation where your physical surroundings and situation have caused you to say, God, are you there? I never read this book because I'm not really that great of an avid reader. But I also didn't read this book because it's about adolescent girls and that's not my thing. But it was a, I remember the title because of where I was. It was the Judy Bloom book, Are You There, God? It's Me, Margaret. Now, has any, any lady in here read that book? Please let there be one. Thank you. In the first service, there was no one. I could have made that book about anything. It was drag racing time. NASCAR was going on. They wouldn't have known. They'd been like, you know, whatever. But 
you know that book, it's about this sixth grade girl growing up, and she's wrestling with the feeling of the presence of God in her life because her parents are going to different churches, and she's going through adolescent changes and things like that. I didn't read the book, I just remembered the title. Because I was in fourth grade in Miss Dockery's class, where I cheated on some stuff and homework, I'll tell you that story another time, but... I was feeling very, very alone. We were not in a Christian home at that time. I was, things were not good with growing up with my dad and, and, and discipline issues and whatever. And I just remember asking, are you there, God? Have you ever asked that question? Are you there, God? It's me, and you fill in the blank. It's me, Thomas. It's me, Sally. It's me, Jonathan. Feeling apart from God, folks, is not a sin. Almost every Christian leader or preacher that I know personally has had a season or a time in their life where they felt alone and distant from God. Where their situation didn't turn out the way they thought it would or should. They knew intellectually that God was real. They had read the word of God, but emotionally they were alone. And they were struggling to hold on to the hope that he cares for them. Even Jesus cried out on the cross, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Now I know that Jesus is probably quoting Psalm 22 and that whole passage about the dogs have encircled me and and, uh, they've gambled for my uh, clothes and that sort of thing there. But, But like I said, I don't look at the Bible through these precious moment glasses. I think that Jesus was struggling in that moment, feeling distant from God. Now I don't know how he could do that because he is God, but don't Precious moment, Jesus. Don't do that. Because the moment you precious moment, Jesus, and remove the humanity from Christ, he ceases to be the high priest whom we can relate to as described by the writer of the book of Hebrews. Folks, Jesus had bad breath in the morning. He had some bad days. If you take the humanity away from Jesus, you can't relate to him. So don't do that. I think that Jesus struggled in that moment. If you feel like John, I want you to know this, you're not alone. You're not some terrible sinner because you feel distant from God. And you're struggling to see that he cares for your life. I have been there. I left a preaching career of 20 years because I could not see past the negative stuff that was going on in my life. I remember the day I was sitting in my office and I was trying to come up with a sermon and I had been struggling for a while to read the Bible and come up with a sermon. And I went in and I asked my partner, I said, can you preach this Sunday? I just have nothing left. And he said, no, it would take me too long. And I said, forget it, I'm done. I quit. I just hit that wall. I went in, I told the elders, I sent them an email and said, this is my last sermon on Sunday. I'm out of here preached another four weeks and did a lot of other stuff but man when i left that was just it i had just hit a wall and had quit and i asked god lots of times do you see me do you see what's happening do you even care at all and let me just tell you that he does i know it might not seem like he does and he doesn't make sense most of the time in my life His ways are not my ways. They're not what I would do, and thank God for that. But try to hold on to the head knowledge that you know about God, that God loves and he cares for you, even if the heart knowledge is shouting so much louder. John's disciples asked Jesus this question. So what was the response? Let's look back to the text. Come back to verse 21. At that very time, Jesus cured many who had diseases and sicknesses and evil spirits, and he gave sight to many who were blind. And so he replied to the messengers, Go back and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, and those who have leprosy are cleansed. The deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. Now here we have to pause for a moment and take in Luke's editorial comments. You have to remember that Luke is writing this gospel account years after it has happened from eyewitness accounts, and he tells us that at the same time that these men are coming to see Jesus, Jesus is doing these miraculous things. At the very time while they're walking to go ask the question, are you the one, Jesus is healing people, and Jesus is preaching. 
And it's clear that these men, these two, these two witnesses, these two disciples of John, they witnessed these miracles for themselves. Now, why does Luke point this out? To answer that question, then we have to turn back to an Old Testament book, the book of Isaiah, and chapter 35. The book of Isaiah is an amazing book because it tells about the coming Messiah. A couple weeks ago, I talked about that. I talked about Handel read the book of Isaiah, and he wrote Handel's Messiah, right? The hallelujah chorus, for unto us a child is born. I won't sing it for you because the last time I did that, it was like, it was not very good. But it is in that book where we get those wonderful prophecies. The virgin will give birth to a son, and, she, and he shall be called Emmanuel, meaning God with us in chapter 7. It's where we get the prophecy, for unto us a child is born, a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders, and, there shall be, and he shall be called the Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace in chapter 9. But when we come down to chapter 35, we see how that, passage in chapter 35 resonates to where jesus is in his ministry at this time isaiah 35 and verse 3 says strength and feeble hands steady the knees that give way say to those with fearful hearts be strong and do not fear your god will come he will come with vengeance he will with divine retribution he will come to save you then will the eyes of the blind be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped Will the lame leap like a deer and the mute tongue shout for joy? Sounds a lot like what Jesus was saying was happening, doesn't it? Just prior to this story, Luke records a couple of miracles. Jesus healed the centurion's servant who was on his deathbed. He was at a distance. <clears throat> the centurion says, I recognize you as a man of power and authority. You can say it and it will happen. Please heal my servant. And Jesus says, man, what great, amazing faith. I haven't seen it anywhere in Israel except in this centurion guy and tells him he's going to be fine. And that man was made well. Then he goes into the city and, and there the widow is where her son has passed away. And he raises the dead woman's son in name by simply saying, rise up. Come out of your sleep. Jesus tells then John's disciples, return back to John. And tell him what you've seen. Tell him that the blind see, the deaf hear, the lame walk, the dead are raised, and the gospel of God is being preached. It's interesting that Jesus never directly answered John's question. Very rarely does Jesus directly answer any question asked of him. He answers in a different way. What he did for these guys was he points them to the evidence going on around them of the miracles and the preaching, and he says, a good student of the Bible would know then that I am the Messiah. Sometimes the best lessons is the one that the student learns without the teacher giving the answers. A teacher can give an answer, right, <clears throat> to someone who has a question, but the best lesson is where the student is helped to come to the conclusion themselves. Let me tell you how Jesus did it in the Bible. A man came up to Jesus and said, who is my neighbor? Right? You remember the story. You know where I'm going. It's the story of the Good Samaritan. And he starts telling this story. Jesus says, well, there's a guy. He's on the road. He's beat up, left for dead. He talks about the priest coming by, the Levite coming by. They don't do anything to help the guy. The Samaritan comes by, who is the unlikely hero of the story, stops, picks him up, puts him on the donkey, puts oil and, and wine on his wounds, takes him to the end, cares for him, promises to repay any debt that he has when he comes back. And then Jesus says to the man, now you tell me who is the neighbor. And the man says, it has to be the one that acted with love. Jesus says, you're right. See, those are the lessons we remember, the ones that we come to understand on our own. And Jesus did that. John would receive this answer from his disciples about Jesus' ministry, about the miracles that were going on, and he would know that though his situation isn't what he desired, he was not wrong in identifying Jesus as the Messiah, and he is the one who was to come and who has even come now. So what is the takeaway for us today? Have you ever wanted something and when you got it, it wasn't what you expected? Have you ever wanted to go date a person? You think, man, I just wish I could date that person. And when you finally get the chance to date them and you come home from that date, you wish you had those last three hours of your life back. You ever been there? You're like, that, that wasn't so great. 
you wanted that new job, and when you finally got that new job, you realized it wasn't as glamorous, and your other job was a lot better than the new job you had? Or you think, you know, I'd like to go to that new church or hear a new preacher, and you go to that new church and you find out it has just as many problems as the last church, and that new preacher will let you down just as much as the last guy let you down? Not that that would ever happen here. We realize that sometimes when the thing that we really want comes, it doesn't come in the way in which we wanted it. You see, people were looking for the Messiah, but they failed to remember that the signs of the Messiah coming were not political rule or military victories. It was signs of miracles and kindness and love and the preaching of the good news of God. And John, I believe, was no different. I think there was a part of John that recognized Jesus as the Messiah, and he thought, hey, we're going to be on top now. Rome's going to be thrown off, and we're not going to have to listen to this, and, and the temple, and all. Everything's just going to be great. But it wasn't. John finds himself in jail, and he finds himself wondering, if God is here among us, and I'm preparing the way for him, then why am I in a dungeon? Why is my situation so bleak? Has God forgotten that I'm his, that I'm on his side, that I care about his cause? Now I'm preaching in his church, I'm serving in his church, I teach Sunday school class, I, I lead the small groups, I, I, I do the children's ministry. Has God forgotten all of that? John was reminded to read the scriptures and to trust the truth of the evidence. I just want to ask you today, are you questioning God today? Are you wondering, like John, where God is? You're not alone. In your doubts. And you're not some terrible sinner because you're struggling to see the goodness around you in the midst of the mire. When, 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 I, when I left the church, I was feeling so alone and I, was just, I just got to this point where God doesn't care. I got to the point in my life where I said, God exists. I didn't come from some, you know, primordial, primordial ooze and some spark happened and poof, out came a human being. I, just, I mean, I couldn't believe in that, but I just thought, he's over there. He don't care what happens to me. And in return, I kind of said, well, then I, I don't care either. I'm not, I'm not proud of these moments, but I'm not saying follow my steps. But I just thought, a great story in this book of old and i don't know where it happened but somewhere along the way <laughs> is the holy spirit opening i i don't know but i just remember that finally someone said you know he loves you because he died for you it used to not be enough i would hear that and say no you know big deal but somewhere along the way it just happened one time when i just realized that if jesus died If Jesus died for me, then he loves me. And life sucks around me. I understand that, but he loves me. And it just got in my mind that I realized that, okay, my ministry is over with in that respect. And it didn't happen the way I wanted to. And the friends I thought would not leave me have left me. And you know, I don't know what I'm going to do. And I, I'm feeling to, But he loves me. It just got to that point. Folks, he loves you. I don't know why God allows you to suffer in seemingly silence. I don't know why he allowed me to suffer in the silence and just watch it all fall apart. I don't, I don't know. And I don't know how your story will end. I don't know when your hardship will be lifted. John's wasn't lifted. John died in prison. His head was cut off. I'd like to tell you, and I will not give you false promises where people say, it'll get better. You don't know that. Don't tell someone that it'll get better because you don't know. When you lie to them and say that, it makes it worse when it doesn't get better because now they feel like there's doubly something wrong with me. Just tell them you'll be there and then reassure them that God loves them don't tell them it'll get better because you don't know you can't see the future you're not god 
I don't know when your hardship will end. I don't know those things. But I know this, that if Jesus were here today in this room right now, which he is, but if he were here in this room in person right now and he could hear you ask this question, I know that he would say this. He would say, have I said that I love you? Did I die on the cross for you? It was easier the first, the first hour. Did I rise from the dead and prove my power over the world? You may not understand, but believe me. Trust in my words. Trust me when I say that I'm coming back to receive you to myself. Hold on for a little while, because the darkness may last for a time, but the morning is coming soon, and so am I. Amen. Folks, Jesus is coming for his church. Life is hard. It's lonely at times. We will have seasons where we feel distant from God, and things will feel hopeless and bleak and dark, but hold on. Trust in the truth of the scripture that you know intellectually so that you can see past the momentary troubles of this life. I'm not saying that they're light and they're simple, but they are momentary. They may not feel that way when they've gone on for 10 years or 15 years or 20 years, but in the light of eternity, they are momentary. And here's where I would say to the church, let me just challenge you, church. You know why so many people think that God doesn't care about them? Because the church has failed to care for each other. And I know that personally because of a church of 270 people that I lived a half a mile away from. Only four to five families even cared to see us after we were gone. And I lived there for another two and a half years. I thought I was having a heart attack shortly after that. And none of those people came to see me that I thought would come to see me. It was the odd outlining two or three people that came to see me. I would not have felt as alone and as upset with God if the church had still come around and said, you're not our preacher anymore, but you're a brother in Christ and we love you. We care about you. How can we help you? What can we do? Folks, we are here to carry each other's burdens while we wait for God to take us home. We do that by showing love and kindness. Walk this journey together as the family of God. James talks about faith without works is dead. And, and I would just maybe add a little to that, but our prayers without doing something is, is almost kind of the same way. I'm not underestimating prayer, but I do have a problem when we say, I'll pray for you. And, and, and we, don't, we, don't hard, we don't even hardly do that, to be honest. Now, some of you do, I'm sure. But I know that most of us don't. We just say that. And if you know that someone is hurting, why not show up? Why do you have to wait for them to ask you to come help? If you know they're hurting, why not show up? You just show up and take a meal to them. You, you show up and you cut their grass when their tractor's broken. You don't have to ask. We just do those things. And when we do those things, we carry the burden. You don't know, but that act and love of kindness lets that person know that God is still there. And you know why? Because God works through the hand. We are the hands and feet of God. That's how he chooses to work. He could just boom, 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 do a genie in the bottle and make things happen, but he doesn't want to work like that. He says, I want you to go and love one another. I want you to be kind. If someone is hurting, you hug on them. If someone needs something, you provide it for them. If someone needs a place to live, help them out. They need a job, help get them a job. They need some food, feed them. They're naked, clothe them. God has called the church to do that. And when you do that, the people will want to come to the church because they'll say, I feel the presence of God here because of the people of God here. Don't give in. Don't quit. God is real he is here and he does care and he will carry you through for his good purpose and his good timing for his good pleasure i look on my life now you guys you can go ahead and come on up i look on my life now and i have been saying this saying i heard it from somebody else it's lifted from scripture Thank you is just not enough to say to God what he has done. 
in our lives since we've come here. It's just not enough. <clears throat> I won't sugarcoat things. I won't exaggerate. We have never been loved as much as we have been loved by this church in the three months we've been here. We've had good people in our lives in our last church. I'm not saying they were all terrible, but we have not been loved to the extent that we have been loved here. We have not had people pour so much into our lives to help us to get into our home and stuff as we have here. Working with a great team of people. I'm not saying the church isn't without their problems, that I don't have my problems, the church doesn't have their problems. It does. Every church does. But I know this, that God has been restoring. <clears throat> this is when I wish you were preaching and I was sitting out there. God has been restoring the years that the locusts have taken from us. In my heart, I was like John, and I thought, God, where are you? And somewhere along the way, <clears throat> the Holy Spirit got me to look at this book again in a new light and say, don't forget what you've learned, Steve. Jesus did die on that cross for you. Is there anything else he could have done to show you that he loves you? There's not. I know it's hard. I know some of you are going through some hard times right now. Just don't think that God doesn't care. He may feel far off, but he's not. You can't always trust your emotions, but you can trust the word of God. If he says he loves you, he does. If he says he cares for you, he does. If he says he's coming again for you, he will. If he says he will wipe away every tear, he will. If he says he will restore to you, he will. He says, I'm going to prepare a place for you that where I am, that you may come and I will come to receive you that you might be with me. If he said that, folks, he will do that. Hold on until he comes. Hold on until he comes. Hold on until he comes and love one another. And you won't feel alone. Let me pray. God, thank you. They just sound, they just sound hollow. Those words just sound hollow. but thank you. Thank you for what you've done in my life here. I'm learning to look back on the struggles and say thank you for those struggles. Because I know that when I see you, I will not walk into the kingdom of heaven without the scars of serving Christ. I'm starting to understand what the Bible writers were saying when they said it was good to have suffered for the cause of Christ. And I know that mine, honestly, Lord, have been light compared to so many others. They've heard all the same, but you cared. Father, there's people in this audience right now that are just struggling with life, whatever it is. They've gone through loss, and they're still working through that pain. They're going through moments of doubt, and they're still trying to find the truth. There's some that haven't been able to let go of the sin of their past. There's that, there's that event that happened, that relationship that failed, that, that marriage that ended wrong. And they've never been able to let that go. Father, let them let that go today. Let them just put it at the foot of the cross where every sin in the world has already been paid for. There's no need for us to carry that burden anymore. And Father, challenge all of us to love one another here, to care for one another, to be inviting of one another, to get in each other's lives, Father, and to be the hands and feet of Jesus. So that when people look at First Christian Church, right here in Marshall, Father, that they see you. They see you. May that be our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm asking you to stand as we sing an invitation song. I'm going to come down front here. If you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I'd love to talk with you about him because he has changed my life. I'm not saying all your problems will go away, but I know this, that God will be with you. He will carry you through. He will bring you into eternity with him. And when this world is over, none of this is going to matter. But what you do today 
to follow him will make all the difference in the world. Don't be embarrassed. Don't delay. You don't know if you have another time after this. You don't know if you'll make it to tonight. So if you need Jesus, you come today as we sing.
everybody.